Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to Hertz Hall. My name is Matthias Tarnopolsky. I'm the director of Cal Performances. It's wonderful to see all the students of the Stephen and Cynthia Rubin Institute for Music Criticism here and some members of the public. Welcome to everybody. Um, Cal Performances is thrilled to be partnering with several Bay Area arts institutions uh, in this initiative led by the San Francisco Conservatory that really aims to elevate the profile of music criticism, thinking and writing about music at the college level. And with us today in the audience are all the future music critics of um, all of the future's music critics. So we hope that you've had an instructive time thus far and hope that today proves even more so. Part of the Rubin Institute's um, activities this week is an important public dimension called Everyone's a Critic. And audiences for performances of the Philharmonia Baroque, the San Francisco Symphony, and uh, the San Francisco Opera have been invited to submit their own reviews of concerts they've attended. So anybody attending this afternoon's concert by the Czech Philharmonic is invited to submit your own review. You can do so online. Instructions are in the program section of today's concert. And it simply wouldn't be right if the most reviews didn't come from a Berkeley audience. So let's make sure that that, that happens. Anyhow, with that, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce David Stahl, president of the San Francisco Conservatory, who will introduce the critics and this morning's session. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome my uh, fellow colleagues to the stage, actually, our critics uh, that have been with us for this week. Uh, also, yes. Yeah. scattered a bit here in the audience, we have many of our student fellows. Uh, the fellows do hail here from Berkeley, as well as Oberlin, Stanford, uh, Yale, and San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Uh, today, uh, we are at the final day of the week, and uh, the student fellows will be reviewing this afternoon's concert. I'm submitting a review by 9.30 tonight, and then tomorrow morning, conservatory at 10 o'clock, uh, we're going to begin a ceremony where we will be awarding the top prize for the music critic over the course of this week, as well as the audience prize that Matthias told you about just a bit earlier. Uh, the point of this institute, though, is not really about awarding a prize. It really is about advancing the art and practice of criticism. And indeed, I think this week it has been very powerful in affecting change in our students' writing and developing for them a sense of not only how they can improve individually, but goals to set for themselves over the long term as writers and thinkers. I think what is also wonderful about this is this terrific panel. I can't say enough about the individuals who make time in their schedules to be here. Uh, these critics are working exceedingly hard across the United States. And in fact, uh, it is somewhat of a, uh, a life in which there's very little time for them to see each other in this context. I have to say what is just as interesting and more so perhaps is the discussion amongst the critics. Uh, this is a rare opportunity for all of us in that way. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank Steve Rubin, though because without Steve's uh, incredible vision for putting this forward and his generosity for this event, we would not be here. So Steve, I just want to say thank you. Uh, today, uh, this is our final uh, public discussion. We really think about this as an open classroom session. Uh, we've had an ongoing dialogue with the fellows in the sense they typically are meeting in approximately groups of six and then working with the critics in groups of two and then rotating and reviewing their work. This is a chance for the panel of critics to come together with the students and often with an interesting exchange of questions. But we do open this up to the public as well so that the questions can span simply beyond also the fellows but to others who have questions for our critics. Uh, today, you see the rather amorphous title, Creativity and Criticism, in front of you. What on earth are we talking about with that? Well, essentially, uh, we have been talking quite a bit this week about the future, uh, both the challenges we see and often the economics around music making of this nature in the world. 
around criticism and the fact that there have been, in fact, a decline in the number of critics, but still there is great music criticism in the world, the change in how criticism functions, the online formats. But essentially, much of this week has been about the future. Also, what is the future of a great review? What does it mean to write a great review? What is a compelling work? One of the comments that one of the critics made to me is, we're seeing reviews here we've not seen before, a take on music or a performance that is not in the traditional framework of criticism. And it's in that way, I think, it's been a, a very interesting week relative to the writing that's been happening by these students. And so to carry on uh, this conversation, to lead us off, I'm very pleased to have my colleague from USC, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, Tim Page. Tim. Thanks very much, David. Um, it's, it's interesting when we get a big topic such as criticism and creativity, because you can pretty much talk about anything. But we all thought that the, um, and, and David very strongly agreed, that we should really be talking about the future now, where things go from here. I mean, let's start off with some somewhat dispiriting um, uh, thoughts about criticism. When I started in this business uh, about 35 years ago, there were at least six or seven classical music magazines that were around. Some of them also combined tech reports. Um, the New York Times had eight or, or so critics who were either on staff or officially approved stringers or regular uh, uh, contributors. Uh, the Daily News had a <coughs> staff music critic. Uh, the New York Post had one staff music critic and three very active uh, stringers, including Spade Jenkins, who went on to, uh, to, uh, to Seattle. Uh, and New Yorker had uh, critics, and New York Magazine, and for the most part, uh, these are all pretty much gone. I mean, not entirely, uh, but it's not the world that it was, the world that really all of us, to some extent, came up in. Uh, and now, uh, after teaching these remarkable young people about criticism, the question becomes, where does it go? Um, I teach a, uh, a program in arts journalism down at USC, um, and it's been interesting to me uh, because when I first came out there, I, I found myself sometimes thinking, why am I teaching this, this seemingly dying art form? Um, but then I went back, and I thought back about 40 years ago when I was going to music school at Manus, um, and I am still in touch with a lot of my, my friends from there, and we didn't all go into the music business or into performing or, or composing, but we're still grateful for things that we learned at Manus, such as actually uh, singing performances uh, or playing in them if we played an orchestral instrument, and just the sort of camaraderie and the instruction uh, in, in sort of a cultured world um, that Manus offered. Uh, and I started thinking about what I'm doing now, and I've now had seven classes, and I think I only have two or three people who are actively working at newspapers in the semi-traditional sense. Um, but I've had people who went on to write biographies. I've had people who've gone on to uh, put together uh, plans for the revitalization of cities through the arts. I've had people who've served as arts advocates in different ways or writing program notes for the opera or for, for the symphony. I've had people who are musicians just learn how to write their own program notes. And so what I think I'm teaching, the way I justify myself to myself when I get up in the morning, is that I'm teaching people some pretty good lessons about how to think, how to organize thoughts, how to write, how to um, get things together to present them as efficiently and as articulately as possible. Um, and, um, and, and so I think that's what's going to happen now, and it already is happening. We, we talked a bit about the fact that nowadays when you get out of an opera, uh, especially opera, since that seems to attract a lot of bloggers, um, you can find all sorts of coverage of it um, elsewhere, uh, on, online, um, and then there'll be other coverage beyond that too. 
Um, back in the day, I remember going to a lot of concerts at the New York Times, which were mostly the junior concerts, and I'd know that I was the only person who was going to make any note that this event occurred. And that's completely gone. So on some levels, people are not yet making a great deal of money on this, but we actually have more writing about music than we've had in a very, very long time. So, I, you know, to, to, to go back to the old cliche, it's sort of the best of times and worst of times on some levels. I'd be curious to know if my colleagues have any thoughts on this. Well, when I hear the term creativity and criticism, I think the creativity required is to figure out what criticism is going to be and going to look like. Creativity about figuring out places to write and ways to write. Creativity to figure out new approaches to writing that are going to speak more to audiences than some of the formulas that have been developed that we've inherited and have done our best to sort of transform ourselves. Um, and then there's a fundamental creativity to writing about music to begin with. Um, Anybody who thinks of it as simply going in and ticking off boxes is probably doing it wrong anyway. Um, you're trying to come up with a document in words about an event. You're trying to come up with a piece of writing. Um, so in a sense, it is a fundamentally creative act. Not that we are creating little works of art in the newspaper, but the act of doing it is creative. Um, our culture has come to value the artifact of art um, to an extreme degree. I mean, we look at the classical canon and these works are great, but there was a time when art was much more about the making of it than the resulting pieces, when music was an activity more than a, a string of works. And I think that sense of creativity, um, rather than thinking of each review as this little artwork, to think of an essential creativity in the approach to art and in the way you disseminate and further the dialogue about art, that um, for me is what that term creativity and criticism evokes. Um, I, I'd like to take that even one step further. Um, one of the things that Alex talked about in his, um, in his pre-concert talk at the San Francisco Symphony was about um, how in times past the uh, new work was really the main part of the program and the old, this canonic um, collection of works hadn't really been solidified yet. And I think that today, that even though we do have the canon and we do have these major institutions that are um, performing these same works of <laughs> Tosca, um, you know, night in and night out, there still is an incredible ferment of people, young musicians who, and presenters and impresarios who are going out there, starting their own institutions, starting their own, um, Ways of, ways of presenting music for themselves and for others. And I think that as critics, we have a really wonderful opportunity um, in following these people and in chronicling um, artistically and institutionally what it is that they are doing to turn things upside down and to make things new. And one of the exciting opportunities for the young critics, um, people, the Rubin Fellows in this, um, in this group and people of their age is to look at the things that people their age are doing in music and write about how they are changing the face of music for the future. I can't liberate this, but no, no, I can't. Um, <clears throat> I mean, what is, what is, hey, here's a question, what is criticism? Um, I mean, in my opinion, criticism is basically a mediating role between the music and the audience. The audience that was at the event and the audience, the wider audience, which is not at the event, is interested in following it. The role of the critic is not to instruct the performers in their art, about which they know a lot more than the critic in almost every case. And if they don't know a lot more than the critic, that means that the critic is a real specialist in playing the bassoon, but not necessarily anything else as part of their job. Um, and it, the role is not to be a program annotator and give you a sort of historical background of the piece. The role is to somehow find a way of translating the experience of hearing the concert through the sensibility of the critic and out to the audience. I don't think that is ever going to go away <clears throat> because I think audiences want to be part of that dialogue and they rely on critics to 
be a kind of uh, uh, translator. I mean, obviously, a lot of people who love some kind of music will gather in the intermissions and talk it up, uh, you know, amongst themselves in the in the foyer. But the critic uh, gives them another perspective. Obviously, if the pr critic is taken as some sort of guru who knows everything and oh gosh, I thought I liked it, but now that I've read that I shouldn't have liked it, I don't like it anymore. That's ridiculous. But if it's a, if it's a conversation among sort of equals, uh, it's of interest. And as Tim said, with the proliferation, not to say the explosion, not to say the sort of sloppy expansion of uh, bloggers, um, you do have a lot more of these voices if you're interested in pursuing opera gossip or opera opinion or whatever particular field of music you're interested in. The, but that all said, the trick, and this is not exactly a revolutionary position, the trick is how to make it pay for the critic. In the old days of, of uh, you know, when I went on the Times, not only did we have seven or eight staff critics, but we had, you know, they all had good salaries, they had pensions, they had benefits, you know, they had all the bells and whistles of middle class life. Uh, they, that kind of thing is a, rarer and rarer now, and the business models for the electronic dissemination of this stuff are at best in an embryonic stage. So now the situation for being a critic is sort of like it always has been in London, where there were very few staff positions and where everybody who wanted to write about music would cobble together some sort of a combo uh, earning potential from teaching, from running small festivals or larger festivals, from uh, writing program notes and contributing to newspapers. Uh, this is aided in London by the uh, more relaxed code of ethics and conflicts of interest that prevail there. <clears throat> but um, in other words, nobody seems to care in London if you're, if you're running a festival and writing reviews. Um, but in any case, I think the future of criticism is inexorable and the, the bump in the road is figuring out the economic model. Well, I think uh, I would very much agree with, particularly with what Heidi said. I think we, we have a responsibility as, as critics to uh, acknowledge this new world which is opening up uh, uh, beyond the, the major institutions. Uh, and it requires some, some extra work on our part, uh, some uh, creativity. Uh, we need to justify uh, these unfamiliar ensembles and, and, and series uh, in uh, not so well-known uh, venues uh, to our editors, uh, to our readers, uh, and to concentrate on them might mean uh, giving a, a little less time to uh, the opera house, uh, the, the major orchestra, uh, and there will be complaints <laughs> uh, from those institutions if there is a cutback. But but I, I think you know between sort of the, the print world and, and the online world, uh, we can widen our horizons and and uh, report on this you know absolutely uh, crucial aspect of of the music world which which has really opened up so extraordinarily in recent years I mean I think of the period that I've been active as a critic since uh, 1992 in, in New York, and it's an enormous sea change uh, in terms of, uh, of what's going on uh, in New York. The, the, the sheer quantity of new music, especially. There, there always was a, a, a lot of new music, but it was, it was highly institutionalized, and there was sort of the, the, the uptown academic concerts and the, and the sort of downtown avant-garde concerts. And it was all rather rigid, and, and now so many uh, events are taking place in Manhattan and, and Brooklyn and elsewhere that are much more difficult to, to classify on, on that old you know, uptown, uh, downtown uh, spectrum and all across the country as, as well. And this is, this is maybe the, the, the most important um, you know, ev event of, of our, of our uh, musical time. Uh, and so we, we definitely should be uh, writing about it as much as possible. I think that uh, I agree with John that it's here to stay, but I feel very, very strongly, hence the, this institute, that it should be here to stay at a degree of excellence. I think we'd all agree that uh, blogging is often an exercise in verbal diarrhea, and it's uh, just very uncomfortable to me to read these people going on and on and on and on and on. And if you speak to any of the lucky fellows, um, 
you will you will find out that they they really are are limited to 400 words. I mean, one of them told me that the, the equipment they produce it on will not accept it if it's 401 words. So um, it's a tremendous discipline, a tremendous discipline. And I must say, the 17 young writers in this group have really packed an amazing amount of information into that short um, short word count. And any writer will tell you that writing short is much more difficult than writing long. Um, so I think that, that we, we, need, we need to celebrate excellence in critical writing. And I think that um, you know, programs like this and others should continue doing that because John's right. It, it ain't going anywhere. Can I throw in one more thing? I'm also riffing off of what Alex said, although I would like to defend some bloggers, Steve. I think that there are some really lousy print critics, as we all know, and there are some really excellent bloggers out there. Agreed. Um, but what Alex was saying about uh, the proliferation of different kinds of events led me to, to think of an important auxiliary topic, which is creativity in classical music. Um, the ways in which we define classical music may be amorphous, but one of the problems that our big classical music institutions are having, and I think that has really been spotlighted for the fellows this week, is that they are not always the most creative places. We think of music as one of the arts, and that is definitely creative, but in fact, a lot of creativity in our society is happening in places that are not our traditional arts, what we define as the arts. You see a lot of creativity on television and in garage bands and different places, and our fellows this week have reviewed Tosca at the San Francisco Opera, they've reviewed Ravel at the San Francisco Symphony, um, and that experience reminds me of my husband's niece, who was a very good cello player as a child, but gave it up to become a jazz singer because she felt it wasn't creative enough. Um, and I think that that's it's not an indictment, but it's something we should remember because we have a knee-jerk assumption that the arts are creative and the role that the arts play in our society today isn't always. And part of our task as critics, as Alex said, is to go out and find the new places and really find where the creativity is. It may not be where you think it is. Can I just chip in? Sure. I mean, I, I agree entirely with, with Alex and Anne. I mean, as, as Mr. Eclecticism and Mr. Alternative Venue for 40 years at the New York Times, I uh, can only agree because that's what I believe too. But what I want to talk about is um, this blog versus print business a little bit more. I mean, one way of looking at it is that your local print critic uh, in your local, usually single newspaper now, uh, somehow speaks with a more authoritative voice and the bloggers are all kind of crazed amateurs who natter on. That's not my experience. I mean, first of all, you can get trapped in a town with one paper and one critic whom you don't like. But uh, there is something to be said by the fact that, the, that the, the, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. In other words, whatever the quality of the local critic, um, you know that person. I mean, I used to always say that my favorite movie critic was Rex Reed because I always disagreed with him. So therefore, if he... I liked something, I knew I wouldn't, and if he hated something, I knew I'd probably like it. Um, but um, there is something to familiarity and getting the voice established, et cetera. But the big, the big difference between bloggers and, and print critics is that print critics, by definition, have to be generalists, and bloggers can be specialists. And, you know, for example, reading some of, there's a guy who reviews Baroque opera for uh, parterrebox.com. And this guy knows his stuff, and it's quite interesting to read him on a, a performance of Baroque opera. Whatever you agree or disagree, the guy is seriously into it. Uh, and daily print critics have traditionally had to cover the waterfront. I mean, I covered rock and jazz as well, but even if you leave out that, within classical music, there's a big jump between, uh, you know, um, Tosca and uh, Bach and Handel at Calvary Presbyterian Church. And, um, and so I, th I think that having all these bloggers, as soon as you learn to weed out the idiots, is, um, is very helpful. It's great. It diversifies the, the field and gives us more voices and more specialized voices. I used to tell people that there's always somebody out there 
who knows more than you do about any given subject or opera or instrument or whatever. And uh, it's instructive to learn from them. Well, blogs have become institutionalized in a way. When we're talking about bloggers, we're talking in a way here about a 10-year-old model. You mentioned parterrebox.com, and that used to be the epitome of the hot-headed whatever. Well, James, well, James Jordan, who founded it, is now the music critic for the New York Observer. Um, Zachary Wolf, his friend who used to write for Parterre, is now at the New York Times. Um, and Parterre itself has become a kind of magazine that's been cited twice here, now with the Baroque Opera, and Josh Kozman mentioned its San Francisco correspondent. Um, for the excellence of writing in it. Um, in fact, I turn to Parterre regularly. So the idea, and, and Parterre still remains in the mind of the audience, this kind of, oh, those crazy people over at Parterre. Well, Parterre is some of the best opera writing in the country, in print or online. So I think the distinction is almost breaking down, especially as blogs have morphed. I think you're seeing some of the, the cranks falling away. It takes a lot to sustain that kind of writing over a long period of time. And I see a seriousness in, in the blogosphere that I don't think it gets enough credit for. I, I would also say that now the Pulitzer Prize is being offered to online writing, yes. which, you know, I mean, they're as conservative an organization as you can come across, and they're now heading to that. John, I'd like to take a slight issue with you on the, on the print. I agree with you that uh, print critics back in the day had to be generous on one level, but I remember there were, uh, and we don't need to get into names here, but I, oh, I, I, so. I, I, can, <laughs> I, I, I can remember a critic who I love to read on The Voice and old recordings and, uh, and, you know, bel canto operas and that sort of thing. And this particular critic was absolutely hopeless when it came to anything Are we talking the Times contemporary. Or talking the Times. Any, anything that happened within his lifetime, fundamentally. Um, uh, Harold, uh, Harold Schoenberg, who was the chief critic of the, of the Times for many, many years, um, he was, he was, I mean, a, maybe a little eccentric on the pianist that he liked a great deal, but he wrote about piano uh, performance with incredible authority and energy, and he, he also was not that interested in anything that happened in his time. So I think you were an absolute generalist, and I was something of one, and there were, there were, there were a, a, a few of us who were doing this, but uh, you kind of knew who you read. Um, uh, yeah, but that's, that's assuming that you are at a newspaper like the Times that had seven or eight critics. I mean, if you're down to one critic, you have to be a generalist, and Harold thought he was a generalist. I'm trying to think who you were thinking about, about this vocal person. I mean, Peter Davis was the best vocal person at the Times when I was there, but he covered everything. So I don't know who you're talking about. Well, well you can tell me yeah, later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if we open it up a little bit? Sure. Because I think that the fellows, and I was talking to a couple of people last night who... Uh, seemed to have uh, uh, thoughts uh, that they were bursting to share uh, on some topics that came up at, at our first session, which, which is maybe really what we're talking about here today, not just the, the future, the present state sure. and possible future of criticism, but of this classical music business uh, on which, of course, we're all dependent. Uh, and, and we simply sort of mirror and react to whatever's going on. So do people want to jump in with thoughts on any of these subjects? Yeah. You know, Jim? maybe you could come up and be handed a microphone because people don't always, you know. Yeah, Joe. Take it away. Thank you. Um, I've actually wanted to continue the conversation we were having because I found it very interesting and I especially, I, some of you guys may have had trouble writing about voices because I always do and just sort of describe, there seems to be a, uh, a um, vocabulary for voices and for you know violin sounds that I I can't tap into and the sort of adjectives and metaphors and things like that and uh, there there was I was trying to describe um, the Scarpia's voice and then I finally looked up some things about him and and, and Joshua Cosman described him perfectly he said open throated singing and that's what I was trying to say but then I couldn't say it because then I would be <laughs> plagiarizing Joshua Cosman so just how do I you I would have said ugly singing, but that's just my <laughs> adjective. <laughs> what did you say? I said I would have said ugly singing. No, that's not nice. <laughs> I'm not nice. I'm a critic. So those sort of timbral metaphors, or do you make up your own, or where, where do you get these? Do you talk to performers? 
I think any time in any kind of writing that you're looking to assume a vocabulary like a mantle, you should look away from that. Um, I think especially if you're coming to it without specialized knowledge, keep yourself blissfully free from that knowledge because by finding a new way to describe voices, you may reach somebody else who's coming to it for the first time. Um, I have found when I'm taking people who know nothing about classical music to opera, interestingly, my, my friends who know nothing about it have had the easiest time locking into voices because people who listen to a lot of pop music, you know, that's where they begin. And they'll sort of, oh, I don't know about opera, but that soprano sounded kind of squeaky and that one sounds, and I'm like, yeah, that's, this is all great. So I think don't, don't needlessly complicate it. People get very tense about writing about the voice and um, throw out the supposed to and just really think about how you reacted. Yeah. Although On the other hand, um, I can't imagine anybody who plans to write seriously about the voice for a long time going without reading the, the, the book, The Great Tradition by J.B. Steen. He shows us how it's all done. And I should really read that yeah, book, given too. my vocal. <laughs> I don't know that. It, it is no. phenomenal. He's no, an think English it's, critic who only died a couple of years ago, and he basically takes recorded voices from 1900 to about 1971, and he goes over all of them, he compares recordings, and it's, it's, it's just like, I, I forget, it was one poet who said that, you know, uh, a, a good new poem would add to our stock of available reality, and that's the way I feel about J.B. Steen. Well, Steen also oversaw those two or three big LP boxes, the record of singing, which, no. you know. No, no, that, that was Michael C. No. Scott, was that's Michael Scott. Okay, yeah, Michael Scott. like I said, Michael C. Scott, I'm not <laughs> But any of it, Steen wrote notes for that, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Or Michael maybe it was Scott, Scott did it, Scott okay, did what do Scott. I know? Anyway, yeah. the record of singing is worth getting a hold of because it's the oral equivalent of Steen's writing in the sense that it gives you an extraordinary collation of uh, historical singing. Yeah. Now, I think it's, it's helpful to, particularly if you're outside of your comfort zone, and, and when I started out, I, I was not comfortable writing about the voice. I, I hadn't studied the voice. I was an instrumental uh, person growing up, and, and that was what I knew and, and felt perfectly comfortable writing about. Uh, and so I, I would look to experienced opera critics. I would, I would look at the lingo, the jargon, uh, and then I would think about, well, what aspects of uh, singing are these terms identifying, and they help me to to, to map out, uh, you know, literally map out the voice, the registers, and and the particular qualities associated with you know each register in each uh, 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 voice type, uh, and and then sort of having become more more comfortable with well, what are what are, am I writing about? Then I can try to find my own words, my my own phrases, uh, as well as sort of using some of the familiar ones uh, in order to to translate the experience into something more in tune with what I hope to be my style you know so that's but but it's I think it, it, it's very important to, to look at what what's out there and, and learn from it David. but I think can I just Sorry. say quickly I think also that um, if you take two recordings of the same piece um, it immediately you don't have to worry about what the what the words are because you can start to talk about the differences in your own terms. It gives you a very concrete thing to focus on. Offhand, Berganzi, Rosbenga, and Stefano. No, I was thinking actually of um, Cecilia Bartoli and Eva Podlesch. Both did almost oh, identical wow. recordings of Rossini arias, and they are wildly different. And some people like one and some people like the other, but there's a lot to say there. Just listening with musicians' ears, my goodness, um, and finding ways to describe the radical differences you're hearing um, is, is a great exercise. Any other? David, I saw you put your hand up. Yeah, I just had a quick, I'm sorry, I really wouldn't comment on this, but I think it's a big, big case. The reality is, I would strongly recommend that fellows consider going to master classes in a variety of instruments and voice types. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, because even though it may not give you specific the language you might use in a review, it will cause you to hear differently. And often in teaching, great teaching, Other questions? Or comments? Comments. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, before the Rubin Institute, um, I was, I've, I've been taking a class um, where we've been reading um, criticism throughout the centuries, including that of Robert Schumann. And one voice or one role he often takes 
is, uh, is of an advocate for, for contemporary um, music and, and uh, performers of his own time. And I, I hear that you uh, also seem, uh, in general, to, to be advocating you know, for, for music, uh, especially contemporary music, and the, the trends in music you consider really important. So I, I just wanted to ask, um, since we as writers about music, whether critical or not, are probably going to be you know, writing a lot about advocating whether it's our own music or the trends we consider significant going forward. So I just wanted to maybe ask you guys about your uh, views on advocacy. I think there's a big difference between being an advocate and being a cheerleader. And I think that's something that everybody wants to keep in mind um, because being a cheerleader, you end up writing puff pieces about, go see this. I think being an advocate means being critical, mm -hmm. being honest, um, making it interesting, and being bringing it into the discussion is your role as a critic in advocacy, shining the spotlight on it, not liking everything. I, I absolutely agree with that, <clears throat> but I think, and I think that one of the things that we can do is to actually go out and find it, um, and bring it into our writing, and bring it into the conversation, and and deal with it critically um, as we would deal with anything else, um, you know, on the same level and with the same standards, and that um, gives it the respect that um, that it should have. I think a lot of critics really enjoy quote discovering close quote performers or composers. It's kind of a vicarious thrill. They, they're not performers and they're not composers, but if they get their name, you know, there was a critic, a copy editor on the Times in the early 60s named Robert Shel Shelton, who amongst Dylanologists is forever known as the man who discovered Bob Dylan because he went down to some obscure little club in the village when Dylan was like 19 years old and said, this guy's a star tomorrow. And it's, it's always quoted in every... Dylan biography or whatever. So Robert Shelton lives on. Uh, <laughs> but all of us, I think, feel pleasure in the success of people that we have noticed early in their careers. Yeah, it's one of the greatest pleasures. And I think it's not just pure vanity and being quoted. I mean, it, just, it, it makes us feel uh, constructive. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but at the same time, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with the, the word advocate, I, I suppose, because, you know, I, I need to have the freedom uh, to, to step back and, and have second thoughts about uh, a figure um, whom I may have you know, written about uh, very positively at first. I mean, I can't be locked into, you know, sort of <laughs> advocacy for, for a, a particular figure or ensemble uh, or, or even the art form itself. I need to have the, the, the freedom to yeah, change direction. So advocate isn't quite, the, isn't, isn't the word, but um, certainly uh, I want to have a space in my writing for uh, enthusiasm, extreme enthusiasm when it's, when it's warranted and, and to feel no check upon that. But in your case, advocacy, in a way, is also writing an in-depth profile of somebody. Well, just to do it to begin with, yeah, right, to, to have to have the space is, yeah. is a kind of I mean, a signal. It's hard. This it's hard exists. It's worth paying attention to, you know, s stop looking at whatever <laughs> rubbish you're looking at and listen to this. You know, not that. But, yeah. but Alice, you're right. You've got to have the freedom to, to disassociate yourself from somebody you've previously liked. I mean, I'm known forever in certain circles as, as Philip Glass's greatest shill, and, uh, and in fact, I have been more critical than not of almost everything he's done in the last 30 years. Uh, I still admire some of the things he's done, and I'm always pleased when the work from like 66 to 85 resurfaces in one form or another. I still think the Met should do Akhenaten. But, uh, but once you've established yourself as, a, as, the, as an enthusiast like that, it's very hard to... Yeah, but the, I mean, you might be referring to, and the, there is another kind of writing uh, possible here outside of, you know, professional uh, music critic employed by a major newspaper or, or, or magazine. Uh, uh, writers, uh, uh, performers or, or composers uh, who, who have active careers who are writing on the side, obviously they have... 
uh, uh, some sort of vested interest. You can call it uh, conflict of interest, uh, but I don't think you need to use that term when uh, their situation is just very visible and, and evident to, to any reader. Uh, uh, you, you know a composer writing about other composers. Uh, is <laughs> there's going to be, you know, uh, uh, they're probably not going to go to uh, certain extremes of, of negativity, uh, but nonetheless, you know, that, that kind of writing such as appears in uh, New Music Box and Sequenza 21 and, and a number of other uh, online publications is, is very valuable, very revealing, and often they're writing about concerts that, that no professional critics are attending, so, so we absolutely need those voices. I would also argue that one of the signs of a mature critic is a capacity to go overboard now and then to get a long ways from the 50 yard line, you know, to, to really find yourself surprised by how extraordinary you find something and, and put that into words, even if, you know, for other people it's kind of a routine event. Obviously, you want to make sure that's at the right time and that you don't, you know, delve into pure silliness, which I have done at least once or twice. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I do believe that that capacity to really lose yourself and become exceedingly moved by something you see is, is something you find actually in more mature critics, I think, than younger ones. I do, I do. Well, you, young, young people think everything that they hear is either the greatest or the worst, or at least I did when I was a kid. And you learn to have that middle voice, but once you have that middle voice, and once you realize that, you know, well, yeah, people kind of know that Figaro is a great opera, if, if you can still, every now and then, really rise to a, to a you know, a, a real fever pitch. I want to throw in one point that touches on something Alex said about having room to step back and change your mind, because I have often encountered the belief from younger critics um, and online critics that you have a responsibility once you've stated your case never to back down from it, and that once you've made your case in public, you must always hold that opinion. And I believe so strongly that you have to be able to reevaluate. You have to be able to say, oh, I was wrong, or oh, I really liked that performance, but this one wasn't so good, and vice versa. And that the idea that that's somehow, and it seems to be a kind of informal code among some bloggers, and which distresses me because that creates a kind of inflexibility of approach that is counter to what we're trying to do. Artists are living, breathing creatures and they change. I mean, it, it, think of the career of Van Cliburn, which was just meteoric and then eventually just petered out because he, for whatever reason, wouldn't increase his repertoire and started playing five concertos not very well and ended sort of sadly. Um, who would have thought? I mean, he was, he was the first guy to ever get a ticker tape parade in New York. Um, musician, yeah. First musician, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good editor, too. Yeah. Um, More? And the same is true the opposite way. You know, a, an artist who, who may start out rather poorly and then evolve into a great, mature, wonderful pianist, singer, fiddler, whatever. Comments? Okay. Um, you, you guys have talked quite a lot about uh, the the fact that there's more writing about music these days than ever, in fact, uh, and there's maybe hopefully sort of a growing literacy amongst our audience about music, which is challenging us in terms of our creativity as performers. But um, one thing that I uh, strongly try to do, and that I have noticed a few of my colleagues are doing as well, is a growing literacy amongst performers. And I'm just very curious, as critics, if you, if you notice that, if you find that to be something that's really powerful, or if we're doing a lot of work and not really making that come across, or how that, how that, if Defi that. Define literacy. <laughs> you mean knowing more music, um, more No, music no. Literature? No, no, I, I mean specifically the sort of empowerment that comes from being able to verbalize your intentions, and I think the more people, as we've been talking about this week, you know, the more you try to write about a concert, the better you understand how you're listening. The same way, you know, learning how to draw teaches you how to see, learning how to write teaches you how to hear about these things, but um, more and more performers are writing their own program notes, are coming up with more literary programming, and uh, to me, that's one of the most exciting things in the field, but we just haven't really mentioned it this week yet. 
I think Jeremy Dank is the perfect example of that. I mean, I'd rather read him than almost anyone else on what he's writing about because he brings so much knowledge to it and he's such a splendid writer. Uh, if you've never read John Adams, the composer, he's also a great writer. There are plenty of people. Hillary a Hahn has a good blog. Mm -hmm. Blog? Hahn. Yeah. Blog. Hillary Hahn's had a blog for a long time. Yeah, he did. All right. I, I really, I, I love it when performers write their own program notes because I think that it really offers a window into, into what it is that they're thinking. Um, for example, Julian Wachner wrote the program notes for the Philharmonia of Rogue concert, and he had a very, very specific point of view about that, which I thought was, you know, was really interesting and told you something about um, who he is a mu as a musician and um, what, what his priorities are and um, what he's looking to do. So I think that for, for performers to do this is a, you know, is a really valuable exercise for them um, and for the audience. And often you find that the, the performances, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't want to make this an absolute rule, but often, um, if somebody writes their own program notes, you have the sense that there's been a lot of thinking about what they're doing, and not just you know running out there and being inspired you know at at the moment. You have to be a little careful with program notes. Uh, I remember something I, I thought very funny that Charles Warren said about Milton Babbitt way way back in the day. Milton Babbitt, I assume most of you know his work and know his really rather dazzlingly abstruse uh, program notes for his pieces. And of course, the, the essay, which he did not title, but it kind of <laughs> summed up the ideas he was going on. He wrote a piece called The Composer is Specialist that was printed as Who Cares If You Listen, which has a certain relevance to what his message was. I mean, he always tried to disavow that. But anyway, one of his um, fellow high modernist composers, Charles Wernin, uh, taking into account the who cares if you listen and these mathematical program notes said, Milton's music would never have attained the, uh, or would have attracted the hostility that he did if he just wrote that this is the cry of a hunted soul, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, we, we've definitely noticed this. Uh, we, we learn a great deal from what performers and composers uh, say about their music. I mean, I think of the, the blog that Joyce Giudonato uh, used to write, which is sort of somewhat in abeyance now, but it's just tremendously revealing to, to uh, read her or see her in the case of her video blogs talking about the loneliness of being in a hotel room uh, in a production out of town and it, and it may, may not be something that that, that uh, we use in review but it just it adds to the sum of our knowledge of of how this music is made but fundamentally this this kind of work this writing this, this verbalizing it's 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 for the audience I mean I think that the, the, uh, they are the ones who need more of a con connection, especially with more unusual repertory, uh, with new music. Uh, I've seen it time and again, a skeptical, murmuring, reluctant, grumbling audience that sees Schoenberg's name uh, on a program, a piece more than 100 years old now, but it still gets that reaction, uh, is uh, placated if, if someone uh, steps up and, and speaks for a few minutes uh, uh, concisely and interestingly about, about the music. And, and, and so especially for, for the audience, for the established uh, listeners, uh, for the, the potential uh, listeners, this is, this is a very powerful tool. And, and hopefully this is part of what we're imparting with this, this week of events is, is some additional ideas for how to do this. I went and heard Dmitry Forostovsky, maybe you heard this, do a song cycle by a Soviet composer whose name after this busy week eludes me, but it was a song cycle Sierra. of yeah, that was it, exactly. Sviridov. 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 Um, it was a piece I didn't know, that the audience didn't know. There were no program notes in the program. And the result was that after intermission, he came out and simply sang this extremely long cycle in Russian without anybody having any clue what it was about, who the composer was. And Forostovsky is a very popular singer, but I have never seen such a bewildered audience. And I was bewildered. And. Uh, and I thought that was such a missed opportunity. There's an intelligent singer who obviously has a lot of thoughts about why he did that and has a lot to say about it, I'm sure. Um, and we are left 
left completely sort of uncommunicated with after a very strong performance of this music. And um, I think that's an old classical music hallmark that we're all eager to break down on both sides of the stage. Also, to be crass about it, um, if you start a blog and it gets read by a lot of people, that will also perhaps advance your careers. <laughs> I mean, as performers or as composers. As performers or composers, yeah. Or writers. <laughs> or writers. Yeah. Yes. Speaking of composer, performer, writer. Not a composer. No, no composing. <laughs> no composing. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what Jacob was saying about um, the empowerment that we're tapping into for performers through developing our thinking and writing. And the examples we've been talking about this week have been Jeremy Dink and Hilary Hahn. And the reality is that most of us will never be Jeremy Dink or Hilary Hahn. And my impression is that um, they are able to tap into this this world of music criticism and influence via their pre-existing platform as the world's top performers. At sure the point that Jeremy no, yeah. Dank did his first New Yorker piece, he was not that well known. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. It's certainly the case with yeah. Hilary Hahn. She was famous quite young and started writing a little later. But with, with Jeremy Dank, I think actually. It's a little yeah, bit. Dank was, Dank Dank was well, kind of, was he was kind of, of a, a, you know, an, fringe, indie, fringe, an indie figure, yeah, you know. Fringe pianist. And he but really. Well, so, okay, all right, all right, so maybe what not. What brought Jeremy <laughs> Dank's success was his writing. What about Charles Rosen? I mean, there you Charles go. Charles Rosen, yeah. perfect example. Um, but and, <laughs> so even if, if Jeremy would think we're discovered, he still, I mean, he still comes in solos with the San Francisco Symphony. I mean, he's. But he, he wasn't. That he wasn't. He began his blog. He began his blog. Ten he, years ago. Ten years ago. He began his blog because he did an interview with NPR and they, and they had him write something. And the editor at NPR said, hey, you're good at that. You should blog. He goes, you think? And he, he had total freedom because he wasn't. He didn't have that kind of career okay. at all. So it's a good example. <laughs> um, but my question is actually um, uh, sort of getting entirely away from that stratosphere of what strategies and advice um, we can um, sort of derive for this new generation of entrepreneurial musicians. And I mean, and whether that means being a freelancer, uh, maybe if you're lucky playing in a symphony orchestra or a local opera or singing in a local opera company, um, ways in which uh, people can find ways to create careers in music or at least have music be a huge part of their lives um, and, the, and how writing can sort of help um, develop that career for them. Because I think this is something that maybe uh, is really relevant to a lot of uh, the people here and the institutions we come from, um, especially, I mean, San Francisco Conservatory, even, um, <coughs> it just, it seems like there's so many people who we've never, just as we have never had uh, more writing, uh, I don't think we've ever had so much wonderful music making on such high levels. And I think that's a, a really exciting thing, but it, it, it also taps into this question we've asked about criticism of how do you make a living doing it? And I'm wondering uh, what you think about how the things we've been doing this week can help that. Increasingly, it seems to me that all critics and all performers are going to have to invent themselves. There are not slots the way there once were, where X number of pianists would be picked up by Columbia artists and they'd spend a few years traveling around the hinterlands and then get their big, you know, their big break. And so anything you can use, you know, personal charm, uh, the intelligence behind your understanding of music, uh, uh, finding an interesting composer, writing really well, um, Anything that you can do to help set you apart w will be helpful. Also, the point of what you're doing is communication. I mean, the point of being a musician, of course, everybody wants to make it and make a living, but you want to communicate something. And being able to articulate your thoughts about it is an important communication tool that helps simply identify the you-ness of you. It's another way that you can show people, what Tim said, what it is you're trying to do. and. There are probably many different applications for it. The point is to, you know, especially if you're making a life as a freelancer, which probably 
everybody is going to be increasingly. You want to have as many arrows in your quiver, speaking as a former freelancer who did just about everything, um, so that when somebody throws an opportunity at you, you can jump up and take it and not say, oh my god, I've never written a program note. But yeah, sure, 400 words on deadline, I can do that. <laughs> It's I'm new. Oh, oh, John. Well, I just want to say that there have been a lot of discussions in our sessions with the fellows about these issues, which and, and most of them are not coming into this program thinking that they're going to go off and get full-time paying jobs as critics. They're trying to figure out why they're taking this, course, this institute <laughs> and, and what it's going to do for them in different ways. And one of the issues that's come up in a couple of cases, including with you, is that if you're a performing musician, and if you are a freelancer, and if you hope to get gigs, uh, if you <coughs> become an independent critic slashing and burning at your colleagues, you're uh, going to jeopardize that. And so, uh, Or if, you, if you're blogging behind the scenes in what you think is an innocuous way, and it turns way. out something emerges that, um, that people didn't want revealed. I mean, that's happened, I think, in a couple cases, uh, one or two opera blogs disappeared, singers writing very revealingly and entertainingly, and then they stopped <laughs> because I mean, the someone fact is, said is that, something. Is yeah. that they're doing the, 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 whatever they get out of this institute isn't necessarily feeding into professional criticism, but it does feed in, as several of us said, into the general communicative uh, advancement of their careers in a variety of different, maybe unforeseen ways. I am afraid I should love to take more questions, but we are at the noon hour, and the critics have a limited time with our students here before we have a conscious afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the critics for this week.